Tonight, debates over our freedom, from protests to sexting and laws that govern religious expression, and why politics is getting personal. Our elected leaders are facing threats of violence. Are they safe? Welcome to Q&A. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Stan Grant. We're coming to you live from Sydney tonight. Nice to have everyone here in the room with us as well. Joining me on the panel, journalist and documentary filmmaker Yara Boomellum, Anglican pastor and theologian Michael Jensen, company director and economist Melinda Salento, New South Wales Liberal MP Jason Falinski, and from Canberra, ACT Chief Minister Andrew Barr. Nice to have you all here. Now, as always, you can stream us live on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Please join the debate and we'll publish your comments on screen from Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter. Our first question tonight comes from Neil Fonseca and it's about the controversial resignation of cricket captain Tim Payne. Good evening, everyone. Um, sportsmen and other personalities in the limelight are not famous because of their high moral or ethical standards but because of their skill set in that particular field. Why are we holding them to such high moral standards when politicians and other members of the public are worse in, in some areas? I mean, it's not like they murdered or raped uh, or uh, did something really extreme, but they did something that was, you know, in that weakness in the moment. Why are we sitting on the judgment throne when we are no one to judge? Neil, just before I, I go to the panel, do you, do you believe it, it wasn't um, such a big deal? It, it's, it's just a big fuss? I believe that, you know, every... We are all humans and we make mistakes. And, How... and, and as a captain, he's not selected as a captain because, um, you know, he has the ethical standards of a Supreme Court judge. He's, he's selected as a captain because he's good in, in what he does, mm. is play cricket and be able to lead a team. How do other people in the room feel? Has it been a, a big deal, too much over nothing? How do you feel? Big deal? Not such a big deal? Mm. Maybe more leaning to, 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 the, to the big deal. Jason, I'll go to this question of, of sports people or cricketers being held to a higher account than politicians. Is that what we're seeing here? Well, look, Neil, can I, can I firstly say that's a great question and it, I think it's a, a question a lot of people are asking. But let me say this to you. Character matters. Character matters no matter where you are leading or what you are doing. And I think all of us in this room can agree, or studio at least, can agree that taking photos of your, your genitalia is a bad idea. Um, sending it to other people is a really bad idea and sending it to a co-worker is just actually plain dumb. Um, I do believe, uh, though, I agree with you on one thing, which is that in the debate between retribution and redemption, I I'm always going to come down on the side of redemption. But he did have to pay a price because character um, absolutely matters and he had to pay a price for that um, because we have to say to people that we value character in leadership. But um, having done that, having paid that price, he should have his opportunity to redeem it. So. Melinda, it's, it's, it's very complicated, of course, because there had been, was some years ago, it had been dealt with, he'd been cleared by an inquiry, his wife knew about it and they'd worked through it, and then it comes up again. Do you have any issues with the retrospective nature of this? Look, it's, I mean, it's messy to say the least, right? And, and Neil, if I, if I can just come back to your question, actually, and, and the way you couched it. Um, I, I actually, in thinking about this, I'm, I'm not applying any different standard, to be honest, um, than I would to my own employees. If I had a member, a senior member of my leadership team um, and I found out that they were engaging in, in this sort of conduct, I'd be really troubled by it. And I actually... It, it wouldn't fly by our code of conduct, all right? It, it just wouldn't. And... My reservation would be of any employee, and of course there is this higher standard of expectation around um, what, you, you know, what you expect of your leadership, not to mention when you're in an environment where you're looking for a leader who has the qualities, the trust and the values to lead an organisation which needs it at precisely that time. So that's the way I frame it up. The retrospective nature mm. of it, 
the way it's being handled in the media with current and former board members debating the rights and the wrongs of this, I just think is, is really unhelpful. And I actually think that for, for people probably within the organisation at the moment, they're not entirely clear what standards are being applied. So mm. I think um, there's not a lot of clarity around this. Um, I think it's really been handled poorly. I, f I actually feel great sympathy for his family that this is now back in, in the media and the way it is. But I also think from what we've heard, it's been bubbling along for a, a while. Um, and I, I actually do wonder why it hasn't been dealt with uh, sooner than this. Uh, Michael Jensen, um, it, it raises questions about... You know, there are all sorts of questions here about consent and at what point consent was withdrawn and the image being unsolicited, but then there had been inquiries into this that had said that there was no case to answer effectively. But there are questions of, of morality um, and who decides those things? Yeah, I mean, there, there is a sort of... There's an unknown thing here, which is what... Because he did say this was... Well, it was said that this was consensual and there had been a process, but then... But then why, why is there a complaint then? Uh, there seems to well, be some Well, the complaint was that it was unsolicited, but, but there is still yeah. more information emerging uh, about uh, it. And I, I guess, I guess the, the, it, it's, it, we hope that the Cricket Australia, in our, in our stead, since we are hoping that they will, they will in some way represent the feelings of the, Australian, of, of the Australian nation now and our aspirations, we hope that they will, they will represent us in their, in their workspace, in, in, uh, in who they choose. Remember, of course, this came out just... Uh, well, the incident happened just after Tim Payne was appointed, after mm -hmm. the Steve Smith scandal. Mm. And so they were very anxious for a new, a new brush, uh, a new kind of clean image. And that's now seen to be quite hypocritical. And I think that's where I'm really... I really think Astra uh, Cricket Australia should be under the microscope here, um, perhaps more than Tim Payne. I mean, uh, the, the Tim Payne issue needs to be, needs to be work out, worked out surely. But um, the... Cricket Australia and the way they seem to cover this up, the way they've now uh, perhaps lent on him to resign, uh, mm. it, that that just because it's come out, that that seems odd. It smells bad. I have to say, I saw an interview with uh, with Bonnie Payne, and she did say, um, "You need to forgive." It was forgiveness was a really strong mm. motif in what she said, and that she had forgiven her husband in that. Um, but we haven't heard the voice of the person to whom. The, the text was sent mm, mm. and whether an apology has been made and whether and she I, is forgiving. I think food. that's been your point, Yara, hasn't it, as well? Yeah, and I think this is um, a recurring theme when we have public figures who are accused of sexual misconduct. Um, I was moved, as I'm sure many people were, when he tearfully apologised and resigned. But then I was left wondering, OK, well, well there's a missing voice here and it's the alleged survivor of this alleged uh, misconduct and and that's a recurring theme that the women and it's invariably women when it comes to people in um, public positions who are accused of this misconduct the women are silent and they're silenced and I think just to go back to your point about mm. retrospect ret retrospectivity um, there is a moment there has been a turning point in Australia this year when women came forward who um, are alleged survivors of sexual misconduct and spoke and we heard their voices and that was really powerful and I think that, um, you know, the voices of people like Brittany Higgins and Grace Tame has really changed things mm. for Australia and now there is more of an expectation um, that public figures will do better. And, and Andrew Barr, to go back to Neil's original question, it's, it's of the standard that's applied and whether this can be applied uniformly and whether people are being asked to meet impossible standards, whatever that may be, and whether a cricketer is being held to a different standard than, say, a politician. Mm. Well, I imagine Tim Payne is mortified by uh, what, you know, the, the public airing of all of this, but it was you know, clearly something that he should not have done. Once he'd lost the confidence of the Cricket Australia board, I don't think he had any choice but to resign, which then leads to the, the question of, well, what standards are being set? And in, in the end, I think he did have to go. Cricket Australia need to show some more leadership and they've got an important choice they've got to make, Stan, and who they choose as the, as the next captain. As and, and, and do they then with... say, I, I'd like to see the history of your text... Um, conversations? <laughs> um, do, do you have to declare everything about your private life, something that may have been years past that may come up... I mean, where does it end? 
Well, I mean, clearly we, we operate now in an environment where you know, people have devices that uh, you know, their, their inner monologues become very public potentially. And mm. uh, we, we see quite a lot of that at the moment. And I, I feel that for a lot of these uh, you know, generally young men who are thrust into the spotlight well ahead of, you know, I guess, having any training or understanding of the world that they're often entering into, that they... I think the sports need to better prepare them as well for these sorts of leadership mm. roles. But yeah. that said, it was a bad mistake. He he needed to apologise and he needed to resign, I, I think. Now, a lot of discussion today around the issue of religious freedom and one that leads us to our next question. I want to bring in Steph Lentz. And Steph, I wonder if you could take us through your own experience with this, both as someone who is a Christian, um, someone who is also come out with their sexuality and then paid a price for it. What happened? Yeah, thanks, Dan. I um, have been a member of the Sydney Anglican Church for most of my life. Um, and uh, I worked at a Christian school teaching English from 2017 to 2019, and I loved it. Um, I think I was really good at my job, and mm. I really enjoyed the colleagues and the um, relationships with students that I had. Um, and in January this year, um, the school, which is actually in Mr Falinski's um, electorate, fired me and um, they fired me because I'm gay and they fired me because um, they disagreed with me that you can be Christian and also live true to the biological realities of your sexuality or gender. Can, can I just clarify that Steph, do you believe that you were fired because you were gay or because you could no longer teach the ethos or the doctrine of that school or had you offered to do just that? I had offered to um, promote the school's ethos on sexuality, um, obviously notwithstanding um, things that I believed would be harmful to the students, but I did offer to back the school's position on a lot of things. Um, however, um, the school wasn't willing to engage in debate on that and um, they terminated my employment because of my sexuality and my belief that it's okay to be gay, that God's cool with it. Okay, I'll put that question to, to you, Michael Jensen. Um, this goes to the nub of the issue. And that is where rights contest, where someone's right to their sexuality and right to employment contest uh, with the religious freedom or the religious expression or the ethos of a religious school. How do we resolve that? Well, it's complicated, right? What we've got to do in a liberal society, in open society, is we've got to make room for uh, for um, different types of different types of view, different types of expression. One of the things with uh, religious groups is that they're not just individuals; they're necessarily communities that uh, express their ethos by by shared statements of faith and shared uh, working working together. Um, the, the current legislation that's uh, before the parliament deals with belief. Um, and so it, it deals specifically with with a with a issue of whether you you sign up to a, a belief a belief statement or not, rather than uh, saying anything about someone's identity or their or their behaviour. It says in particular it de deals with that. Um, but uh, but because there are difficult there are difficult cases does not mean that we shouldn't promote the the, the freedom of rel religious groups and religious institutions to be able to employ who they want to employ. Uh, reasonably um, and with, with clarity about their, their doctrinal statements and doctrinal positions. But, it's, but Steph's sitting here tonight, what do you say to Steph, who is a Christian and still hold a Christian faith despite this experience? Yeah, I've obviously had to rethink a lot of things and I do believe that I have a very well-researched and well-thought-out stance on a lot of the, um, the Christian doctrines that I have believed and some of which I continue to believe and some of which I've changed my mind about. I think um, with, with good sort of academic backing. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's troubling that the Christian community in Sydney broadly does not seem to be open to the fact that I can belong there too. Mm. But that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue for the Christian community to, to talk about and for you to contribute to, the, to that, that particular theological debate. But the, the issue at law is whether there is freedom for a, Christian, for a particular community to, to express its identity in that particular way too, isn't it? And, and Jason, that goes to the, the point of the legislation. I mean, this happened in, in your electorate, so Steph, the, the school was in your electorate. Is this the sort of thing we would see more of under this legislation, that a school would be able to say, you don't fit the ethos of this school, mm. therefore we can mm. pay? So, so Stan, um, the first point I would make is 
this occurred before this legislation was even written. So that's the first thing. And, and Steph, can I say to you that um, that was that what you've gone through, no one should have to go through. So to the extent that it's, it's not worth much, I'm sorry you've had to go through that. Um, what I would say, though, um, about this legislation is that as a, as a liberal, a philosophical liberal, I believe that the role of the state is to maximise the freedom of individuals wholly consistent with the freedom of others. Now, we talk a lot about in Parliament about the economy, about infrastructure, about climate change. These things are about the su sustaining life. What Steph um, is, has gone through, what Steph believes, what people of faith um, believe are the things that make life worth sustaining. The role of any government is to ensure that those things are protected. Because if our nation is to mean anything, people need to be free to express themselves within that context. What we are trying to do here is very difficult because, as I'm sure Andrew is about to tell everyone, you have intersections where, mm. people, where you have faith um, coinciding with people's personal identities and beliefs. They are difficult things. They need to be encoded in law so that people are protected and so that those freedoms are ensured. Let, let me bring in um, Andrew. And the point being here, Andrew, is that there is a, uh, you know, federally there are laws against discrimination on the basis of race or gender or sexuality, but not religion. Something is missing, isn't it? Well, I think religious protections are well covered uh, within state and territory, uh, anti-discrimination law. But, but not federally, and that's the point here. And, and not in New and, South Wales. And, and not, in, not in all states. Or South Australia. So is there a need, is that the piece that's missing? If, if you can be protected for discrimination against on the basis of race or gender or sexuality, why not protection of religious expression? Well, that, that's a, a fair point, but it depends on how it's framed. So I would suggest look at the ACT Human Rights Act uh, as a very effective way uh, to provide those religious protections. But to Steph's question, um, I, I'm just so sorry to hear that, Steph. Um, that's terrible. I, come and teach in Canberra. You are really <laughs> welcome in our city. We will value you for who you are and the wonderful professional skills you could bring to our education system. Al although one, and I'm one, sorry one you've been discriminated against. It's terrible. It shouldn't happen. Once that, once that law, if it is indeed ultimately is passed in this form, um, would that not override the laws that you have in the ACT? And what recourse would you seek? Because I understand in Victoria mm. there's potential of a High Court challenge. Is that what you'd look at as well? Well, we'd have to consider uh, our, our legal position. We're in a, a constitutionally weaker position as a, as a territory, but we have a Human Rights Act and a Discrimination Act that provide uh, excellent protection that, uh, for people uh, of religious faith, but balance those rights uh, and ensure that you know, everyone is equal before the law. That's the sort of Australia that I want to live in. And, and in my part of Australia, in Canberra, that's the law and that's where we're all equal before the law in the ACT. That's how it should be everywhere. But Melinda, that goes to the nub of the issue here. We talk about equality, we talk about people being equal before the law. Let's wind this back a little bit and to the case that really got people fired up about this and what we've seen eventuate, and that is the Israel Folau case. A um, bit of background is a rugby union player, um, who had, a Christian who had posted things about homosexuals, um, fornicators, adulterers, um, drunkards, on and on, who were going to go to hell, he said. They're condemned to hell. He then lost his job, effectively. Should he have lost his job for what was an expression of a fundamentally held faith? And how do you deal with that in a workplace environment? Can I say, firstly, just on the last question, I think this is one of the concerns I have with where we're at right now. Um, and you're already seeing businesses and business groups sort of reflecting that they're not sure how this plays out um, and how they're going to deal mm. with this and what the implications for them are as they deal with the laws and, and, and the regulations of this. If I come back to the Israel Folau issue, the question I've always had on that is, um, and it's, it's a bit of my concern on this issue as well, around, um, I think, I, I personally, philosophically, I'm in support of free speech as well, but I think it comes with a huge responsibility. And the question I've always had, quite frankly, about those comments is why? Why were you saying them? Why did they have to be say, said in that way? Where was the reflection on who you were talking to? Why you were, why you were making those statements? Um, 
and where was the reflection on the potential impact and harm for people and, and, and weighing those things up and balancing those things. So that's, that's a little bit of my concern around where, where does the balance lie in this in terms of your responsibility to think about other human beings, the things that you're saying and how you say them. Mm. Uh, so I, th I think it's a really fundamental issue. Y Yara, where do you sit on this? Uh, you know, Israel Folau at the time had said he believed this was an expression of his faith, firmly held, and he said an expression of love. He said he wanted to save people and he felt compelled to say this. He stood by his comments. He ultimately paid um, a price for that as well. We're all talking about these rights, these contested rights. Steph has paid a price for this. And where rights are contested, where do we fall on free speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of your own identity in a pluralist, secular society that is still bounded by religion and faith as a, as a central tenet of our societies? Mm. I think um, Andrew Barr was right when he said that we're mostly covered when it comes to religious discrimination laws, and that was actually mm -hmm. what was found by the Philip Broddick government review mm -hmm. on this very issue. Um, he said we didn't actually need to do anything on religious discrimination. We were all covered. Um, now, Scott Morrison bringing this in and saying it was an election promise from three years ago... Which, which he did get a mandate for. He won the election. He also said three years ago that he was going to bring in a federal integrity commission. <laughs> I think, I think uh, Bridget Archer, the Tasmanian Liberal MP who crossed the floor today to support an independent proposal for a federal ICAC of sorts, uh, spoke for many Australians when she said she found it offensive that we're prioritising a religious discrimination bill which is not needed when there are so many other pressing issues we could be looking at, like a Federal Integrity Commission. It's certainly been a pressing issue for you, Steph. Um, uh, do you think you've any clearer tonight after the discussion, or has it just raised more questions? I have a lot of questions about yeah. it, Stan. May I address Reverend Dr Jensen with my yeah, question? Yes, just, just quickly. I've written this one for you, Michael. As a learned and, learned and experienced leader in the Sydney Anglican Church, do you believe it's OK for churches and Christian organisations like the school that fired me to be legally protected in excluding and denouncing certain people in order to preserve a very narrow interpretation of theological correctness? Well, I don't, I don't believe it's... Uh, I don't think there should be protection for, uh, for abusive behaviour or being... Uh, or the, you know, and I've got to say, I think the, the issue uh, where you've experienced particular discrimination goes to the Sex Discrimination Act as well, which needs clarification. It's out, that's way out of date. I do think that Christian organisations ought to be able to teach traditional marriage as traditional marriage has been um, taught by ma the majority of Christians over, over 2,000 years and is still uh, believed by many Australians. I think they shouldn't do that with, uh, without compassion without, uh, and, and they shouldn't do that in an offensive, uh, in an offensive or vilificatory way. But I do believe that they should be able to teach uh, and hold to traditional marriage, yes. But Steph. no one's stopping them from doing it. Steph, th th thank you so much for, um, for, um, for your question thank as you. well. Good luck with your, um, your teaching career. <laughs> Thanks. Um, our next question, and it stays on this issue as well, from Monica Dennett. Political parties are given broad exemptions under anti-discrimination laws so that they can hire staff who share their beliefs and terminate those who don't. Why should political parties be given more rights to maintain their ethos than religious organisations? Guess who that's going to, Jason? Well, I, <laughs> look, I'm shocked. You don't want to take this. Uh, um, Monica, can I say, I absolutely 100% agree with you. The amount of exemptions that parliamentarians and political parties generally get from a whole bunch of laws that apply to ordinary Australians or, or average Australians is just absolutely extraordinary. In fact, I wanted to introduce a bill at one stage, which I will never do, um, that goes along the lines of... Everyone in Australia should have um, access to the same exemptions that political parties and members of parliament have because we, we are very good at imposing more and more government upon people um, and, but making sure we're exempted from it because it's too tough for us to look at. And I, I really think that it is, what is good for the goose is good for the gander and I think if it applied to us... Um, personally and, and specifically in terms of political parties, what you would find is a lot fewer laws coming out of all parliaments in Australia because, you know, we wouldn't be able to cop it yeah. ourselves. It, it does raise the question, Andrew, and the, the, the point of the question being that, you know, we apply certain, um, 
you know, standards to religious freedom or other freedoms, and yet political parties are able to operate above that, pick and choose exactly who, you, who works for you and, and, and why. Is that a, a double standard? Well, I don't think it is in the context of uh, employment within our... I mean, I, don't know, I can't comment on the federal employment arrangements for federal members of parliament staff, but as it relates to employment within uh, the ACT parliament, uh, you, you, are, you have certain protected attributes under our Human Rights Act. I wouldn't imagine uh, you're employing someone who disagrees with your political position, though. <laughs> Uh, well, in, in your office. <laughs> not necessarily someone from the other side of politics and membership of another political party. Yeah. But, but I couldn't discriminate on the basis of someone's sexuality uh, or whether they had a disability uh, or not. But then equally, I don't get many applications to no, work from me, Stan. I wouldn't imagine from, you uh, would. <laughs> from right-wingers, you know. It's not... I wouldn't imagine you would. But, but, but Melinda, um, one of the questions that's been raised today, and the Prime Minister has spoken about this, in terms of identity politics cancel culture. It's not just about religious freedom. It is about the right to express yourself and freedom to express yourself in a society where you can and, and we see indeed happen that people can be cancelled. Does that concern you, the, the creeping impact of what's called cancel culture? It does, actually. Um, and, um, I mean, you, you know, Stan, I've had a fair bit to do in, in the Indigenous space and, and reconciliation and... Mm. You know, I actually really think what, where we've got to get to is trying to find a way to have um, open conversations and to get people's views on the table. But as I said before, I think it comes with a responsibility to be respectful, to be constructive and, you know, to try to find the places that you agree um, and then to explore the, the places that you disagree um, f for a purpose. But um, it's getting harder for us to do that, it? Isn't absolutely it? is. And, you know, you, if I can just go back to something you said before around... And, you know, I'm going to get myself into a stoush here, but... Um, you know, Israel, Israel Folau saying, you know, I was trying to help people. I just really find that hard to believe. Well, that's, it's certainly how we saw it. That, that's no, what I know, but, but to, 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 to fling out a, t a tweet like that, that's not, that's not influencing people. I mean, we all, that's not how you change people's views. Hmm. You bring people together, you have respectful conversations, you explain your perspective, you don't scare the bejesus out of them. So I, I just, I think we've got to find a better way of doing this um, and I think it's got to be based on where we, we try to find... Um, a way to understand each other's perspectives, um, to not sort of use it as a means of defining you as, as good, bad or worthy of speaking to or not. And, and that's where we've got to get to. Um, and I feel like we're sort of getting a bit further away from that at the moment. Just quickly, Stan, Jason. Stan, if I could add... Yeah, just quickly, Andrew. Yeah. Well, just to say, I don't need saving. Gay and lesbian okay. people do not need saving. And so the starting point in this debate, you know, should not be that we are broken and that we need love or saving... Uh, even by well-meaning Christians. Mm. Thank you very much. Jason, just quickly. Well, it, well look, I, I agree with Andrew and, and I agree with Melinda about the impact of Israel's comments. However, um, Voltaire said it best when he said, I, I, I may disagree with you and I disagree with Israel mm. Flau and I disagree with people who are trying to save Andrew, um, particularly from political oblivion. But what I would say <laughs> is... But what I would say is this... Um, Voltaire said, I may disagree with what mm. you are saying, but I'm going to defend your right to say it. And one of the things that concerns me is about going to your point, Monica, that when we have government creep in these areas where someone else gets to decide what is, what is good speech, what is correct speech, what is bad speech, then we end up in a very dangerous point because express, free expression has always mm. been a cornerstone of liberal democracies. Now, if you want to take that away, then I think you need to be a bit honest about it. Uh, well, that, that okay. leads us to the, to the next question we have as well. It comes from Sanjay Alapakan. We've seen stories week after week about politicians, now at the senior most levels, receiving violent threats at an increasing rate. Aside from being a very serious safety concern, the threat of violence could chill free speech. What concrete solutions are there to bring back decency in public discourse? And how do we account for the role of social media in driving hostility in politics, given that algorithms are skewed to deliver content to us that outrage us? Yeah, Yari, you look a lot at technology and, and its yeah. impact on our lives and social media, and there's no doubt um, people have more access to other people and the conversation, as uh, Sanjay pointed out, is much more heated. Mm. But I think we need to kind of understand, as Sanjay put... Uh really well that um, social media platforms and big tech in particular um, they do have algorithms that 
are designed to keep you on their platform for as long as for as long as um, for as long as they can really in order to sell you things and push ads to you and it doesn't matter what the content is that you're looking at it's not about social cohesion they don't care what you're watching um, so long as you can go you go down this rabbit hole with them and they can keep you there for as long as they can then you know that's that's the sort of model that they have mm. and we heard from we've been hearing from whistleblowers like Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower who testified to US Congress that companies like Facebook put profits over humans. Um, and until we regulate these big tech companies and put stops on how these algorithms are basically designed to keep us there online, no matter what it is that we're watching and creating this sort of outrage culture, then I think we're going to continue to see these problems on the streets play out. Andrew Barr, you have dealt with this personally, haven't you? Mm. Yes, a few fixated individuals. Mm. Uh, it's, it's amplified in, in social media. Uh, and yes, it's confronting. Uh, it does lead you to perhaps think twice about how, mm. uh, you know, how you approach your job. Um, I guess I've had to learn to be a lot more resilient. You need, you need a thick skin in politics, full stop. But things have crossed you know, lines that are, are just you know, not acceptable. Uh, not just for me, but for... Is this, know, is this th threats of physical violence as well? Oh, yes, and, and I guess fixation, stalking, uh, you know, some, some behaviour that's pretty un, unsavoury. I, I haven't experienced the, the sorts of, of things I've seen uh, my, some of my state and territory colleagues in, in Victoria, Daniel Andrews and uh, Mark McGowan in WA and uh, Mike Gunner. Uh, Mike Gunner in New South, in New South Wales, in the Northern Territory. Uh, it, it has just been an extraordinary, well, it's really confronting period. And we just need to be unequivocal in saying this is not acceptable in Australia and just calling it out, no ifs and buts, or else I fear we're, you know, we're on a path that we've seen in the US and, and the UK. Mm. And that's not a place that Australia wants to be. And it, it happens to politicians on all sides of politics. Mm. Uh, and it's... I don't think it's good for our democracy, and it's certainly not good for, you know, the, the, particularly the families of the politicians. Mm. Mm. Um, Michael Jensen, you've talked a lot about the need for kindness or to be gentle, um, gentle in disagreement, kindness to those who disagree with you. That is not our age, is it? No, no, and, and uh, it's exactly as Yara says. It's, see, it's uh, the um, social media platforms. Uh, they get money from whipping up the whipping up the debate. Uh, Trump was the best thing for Twitter, even though uh, Twitter pretends to be woke. It's not because it loves it loved the it loved the the right wing. It actually it actually really loved that kind of tension and 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 the extremists. It really profits out of that. Uh, it would help if politicians would tax them. Uh, that, would, that would be a good start to kind of properly tax these uh, big surveillance capitalists. But we can do something too, and that is uh, we shouldn't just rely on governments to do it. We, the Australian people, should, should be more active and engaged and, uh, in, in, in our political system, in our political debate, uh, and actually produce the kind of conversation we want to see happening. Because most people do want a more gentle, a more kind kind of conversation. That's why we have Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> Stan, can I, can, I, can I just... I mean, um, I, I, you know, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. I'm just going to put a little positive note in yeah. here, po possibly. And it's a little anecdote. Please but, do. <laughs> um, t two of my daughters um, ha have actually just take, taken themselves off social media mm. um, because they've just looked at the tone of it. Um, and have just decided, of, the, with, of their own accord, without having any conversations with us, they just decided it was um, not the sort of tone and the way that they wanted to engage, and it was it was all consuming. And they actually took themselves off it. So, <laughs> I say, I say, how tough is, is, that, yeah. is, is that something that, that a lot of you are doing? Is that something that a lot of you are doing right now? Put your hands up if you've taken yourself off, off social media. Hands up. Oh. There's a few. There's a few. Can be addictive, though. I, can just, it? I mean, I, I just use it for. I share. I've got rules about it, so I, I use it to share information about things that we're we're doing at work to connect people to ideas. It's always positive and it's always information, and I don't I don't engage with mm. with negative. 
and you just I just ignore it. But I just think it's just a reminder that we can get caught up in it, but th there are people out there who've got their antennas up. There are kids out there who are, who are figuring this stuff out yeah. as well. It's worth but saying to the media as well that there's a, that I've seen more discussion of extreme views. And the more you give them oxygen, the more mm. they have power. And, and I think there's, there's a way in which the media has a role to starve the, the oxygen out of uh, extreme, extreme mm, voices. Mm. Um, so sometimes they can drive it underground and make it even more, more virulent, though, of mm. course. But Jason, you know, we've seen in recent times um, Jackie Lambie's number, for instance, being mm. handed out. On mm. social. Should there be consequences for things like that? Absolutely. This is what, yeah, what, yeah. what? What consequences? Well, the ESAF, uh, so th this parliament, like Australia leads the world in regulation of big tech, in particular around this information stuff. So the eSafety Commissioner um, has the capacity to issue orders without having to go to court, so immediately um, take down orders. So things like Jackie Lambie's number mm. being taken down, and, revenge, and, and, for, and, for, and for Malcolm Roberts, there should be consequences? And, uh, is that what he did, is it? Well, is that, that the that's, person? That's, that's what we've been... That's well, I, well, in my personal view, absolutely. Mm. Because the real issue of the 21st century, or well, I think one of the biggest issues in the 21st century, is going to be our right to our information and our privacy. Because if, if we are anything, it is, our, it, is our, it is who we are. And, yes, we've shared all that, or a lot of people have shared a lot of that on social media, but it, we didn't give it away and we should have a right to reclaim it. And if that isn't done in this century, then we will be looking at a very different um, species by mm. the end of the 21st century. Well, on this question of anger and, and protest, our next question comes from Hanan Dover. The Prime Minister's response to the protests, where clearly violence was incited, was to pass off their protests as a reflection of their frustrations. Why do vi um, white extremists get a free pass, whereas Muslims who express their political views without violence are subject to the violent extremism, the war on terror and security framework? Jason Falinski, this is in, so, this uh, in response to the Victorian, yeah, the no, Victorian protests. Sorry, is it Mila, sorry? H Hannah. Hannah, sorry, Hannah. Um, so, Hannah... Um, I, look, I've got, I've got to fundamentally disagree with you. No one in Australia gets away with violent extremism. Not, it doesn't matter who they are, where they're from or what the case may be. You do not get away with it. Um, the Prime Minister condemned... Um, because there, there wasn't violence at the protests in Melbourne, which I assume is the one you're referring to. He condemned the violent intent. He, he condemned the violent words. He condemned the um, uh, people trying to incite violence. At that, um, at that, uh, at those rallies, um, but the important thing was, but what he said at the uh, on the other side of it was, look, I understand that people are frustrated with what's happened. There, there is a great Walt Whitman quote, um, which I, which I um, didn't read. I heard it on Ted Lasso, which goes <laughs> along the lines of, Ted Lasso is a much kinder world, isn't kind it? Ted, like, we, Stan, if but we, we could all Ted. be more like Ted Lasso. <laughs> um, but um, what, uh, which was be curious, not judgmental. Yeah. And, and I think that goes for everyone in Australia and I think the, it goes for everyone at those protests. The, the problem here, and I think this is what Hannan is referring to, is the but. Yeah. The, the yeah, equivocation absolutely. that says absolutely. people are frustrated, people are angry. It's getting the message right, is it, Melinda, on this? Look, I, I have to say, I'm going to say a couple of things. One, wh where are my Ted Lasso cookies? I know, I know. Um, I know. Number one, but in all seriousness... I did drive up from Canberra. <laughs> I, I do think... I, I actually have some sympathy here. I think if this was a different crowd um, with gallows being displayed and whatever else, I, I do, I'm going to say I do wonder if there would be a but there. Um, and I think, this is, I think this is too important an issue to have a but. I okay. think we've got to be super, super clear... <laughs> And I, I, I really think it's got to be super clear and it's there is no place for this in Australia. No matter what your frustrations, no matter what your beliefs, there are other ways of expressing them. Yeah? Yeah, yep. sorry. So, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, where, so in Melbourne, where, where you're from, yep. um, about a month ago or two months ago, there were um, protests that look a lot like riots with a lot of people with T-shirts with CFMEU on the back of them. Why has no-one called anyone out for, um, you know, the condemnation of that actual violence? Like, law enforcement agents were getting beaten up by people. Oh, I've got... I'm, I'm not defending them either. I'm but not you, defending no, no, them. I'm talking... The unionists at the time did actually call that out. Sorry, yeah, absolutely. The unionists at the time did call that out. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah John said because input. There were a lot of other political leaders, and I'm, I don't want to get mm -hmm. into a partisan thing here, 
who let that one slide through. I'm not. Uh, I'm being asked about a, about this situation, mm. and I'm just trying to be really clear. I mm. think this on these things, we, we can't afford not to be heard really clearly. And it just it, it was really. I found it really disturbing to see those images here. Um, and to think that that's where we're, we're heading in Australia because I, I just don't think it's where we want to be. OK, well, I, I need to respond to this. Mm. So, in, as Chris Yulman said, in 1977, there was Sir John Kerr getting burnt, an effigy of Sir John Kerr, not the actual Sir John Kerr, getting burnt um, in Canberra. So, we're not heading anywhere. This, is, this has been an unfortunate part of people's protest. But what I keep going back to is... Hannah, I think you're right in terms of we need to call these things out. But why do we wait? Why do we wait until it's a protest against Daniel Andrews and it's the Prime Minister and he said a but rather than mm. the protests around the CFMEU that happened a month ago? Uh, Andrew Bell, I'll, I'll get your thoughts on this. Well, I mean, the CFMEU office was the building that was being attacked. They were the subject of the violence, not the perpetrators of it. No, that's, that's, not that's the point. So that, that, that is the point. It was the things that were being thrown at CFMEU officials. So who was wearing what T-shirt, Jason, doesn't necessarily uh, indicate, you know, where they came from. And those, and those violent attacks were condemned right across the political spectrum. But when it, when it comes to uh, the Prime Minister's comments, there, there was no room for a but in that. No level of frustration justifies threats to kill the Premier of Victoria. Mm. Can, can no I... level of frustration justifies that sort of outrageous behaviour and it has to be called out. No ifs, no buts. Can, can I bring you in, Yara, on this? Um, and even when you, you know, even when you try to sort of couch a question around this and you end up using the word but, the, the, the reality is, though, that not everybody at the protests that we've seen would be expressing violence. People have been frustrated. There is so much of a sense after the past two years of people being pushed to the wall in so many ways. And this is this inevitably what you see in a pressure cooker environment? I think um, this goes back to what we were talking earlier with social, um, social media and social disinformation campaigns and how easy it is to get brainwashed online. It only takes six months to get brainwashed online. Um, and I think what we're seeing is, again, another, another symptom of our inability to deal with tech companies and the profit model that they have, which is pushing people into the extremes. And I think that what we're seeing now is the outrage online playing out in the streets, and that's what we need to deal with. I want to go to our next question. It comes from... <laughs> Thank you. Our next question comes from Rafi Skidmore. Oh. Sorry. There you go, Rafi. We've, we've uh, caught you out there. You weren't coming yeah, off, were you? Anyway, <laughs> I'm a constituent of Jason Flinsky's and am pretty concerned about the dangers that technology poses. Uh, my question is both to Yara Bomellum and Jason Flinsky. How does one justify the use of facial recognition in mass surveillance by the Department of Home Affairs? Jason. Uh, I feel Yara should go first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh so gracious. Um, well, the answer, the answer to your question is, um, Rafi, what I was saying before which is the biggest issue of the 21st century will be... And, and what you haven't added to that is the development of artificial intelligence, quantum mm -hmm. computing, um, mass collection of data, which can then be both stored and analysed um, for future use, um, and, and the fact that our identity, which, you know, if you... Um, you can leave your mobile phone at home if you don't want to be tracked where you're going at the moment, but we will very shortly live um, potentially in a world in which um, a, a whole bunch of images can be um, collected, stored and, and analysed for use later. And if we do not get control of that element of where we have control of our private data and who we are, then, as I said before, by the end of this century, humanity is going to look much, much more different than it does at the moment. I mean, I think um, what Yara is saying about social media and how it drives people to the extremes because it engages their emotions and it keeps them online, et cetera, et cetera, is all true. Um, but there's, there's more um, both um, interesting stuff coming down but also potentially very dangerous stuff coming down. It, it does go to the questions of, of privacy and who owns what and how do you own your data, doesn't it? Um, 
Totally, and I think the thing to remember when it comes to mass surveillance and facial recognition systems is the fundamental question here is what is it to be a private citizen in the public sphere? What does it mean when you walk out into the street and you're being analysed by a computer vision algorithm that's on CCTV cameras or when you post images of yourself up online mm. and they're being analysed by facial recognition systems? So I think... I think just to go back to the point about home affairs having facial recognition systems, I think the issue at the moment is that they're quite new technologies and they're very imperfect. They're, they're imperfect. Yep. And um, we've also found that there's racial disparities in the, in the way that they analyse people. So people with d darker skin tones are often misidentified. And for that reason, um, many companies like Amazon, IBM, Microsoft have pulled their facial recognition systems off the market because they realise it's imperfect and it's leading to bad outcomes. So that's one point I would make and I think there was a US study that actually said that um, uh, people who are black are five to ten times more likely to be misidentified. And the study actually looked at a technology that's being used by the Victorian police at the moment. And so I think that's something that we need to bear in mind with these facial recognition technologies. Um, but the other thing is, when it does come to privacy and our right to privacy, mm. there's actually a line from my film, um, Unseen Skies, where, where Edwin Snowden says, um, a child born today will have no idea what it's like to have privacy. And I think, and I think that's really important when it comes to what it means to be anonymous what it means to make mistakes, what it means to grow and evolve as a human being. If we can't do that in private, if we're being watched and analysed um, across mm. our entire lives, you know, what, is, what does that mean for us and our own growth? Our next question comes from Carlo Missio. Thanks, Dan. Hi, Carlo. A key contributor to Australia's development has been migrant workers who once upon a time could come to Australia with the aspiration of making a health, happy life for themselves and their families. With the median house price across Australia scratching about a million dollars, what's the incentive for these people to come and work in Australia now? Is Australia still the lucky country or are they destined to be permanent underclass? Melinda Slato. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's, it's a really good question and I know plenty of people who are very worried about issues of um, housing affordability and we can handball that one uh, to Jason, who I'm sure is... <laughs> We're in Sydney, we've passed <laughs> um, Yeah, OK. I'll pass over. Um, Migration's been in incredibly important to Australia's economic development but also social development. And, and I think one of the... Can I just make the obvious statement that, you know, what we've seen in the last two years is it's been an incredible dislocation. Um, a, a huge dislocation. We went from 2019 in the world where it was maybe peak mobility, if you like, and just to put it into perspective, there were 275 million people identified as international migrants in 2019, and then you fast forward to 2020 and it's just nothing. Lots of people went home and there's a lot of conversations about what's going to happen now and where, where are people going to go. Can I say one thing that we've seen is that the, the conversation around migrants driving up house prices has possibly been disproved in it the has, last few definitely. years. <laughs> sure. um, yeah. As have a whole bunch of other things that, that we've done a bunch of research on at CEDA around the influence on, on wages and, and everything else. But um, in, in terms of where to next, I think there's a big challenge for us in terms of thinking about how we recalibrate migration from here, um, how we think about what we need now. I'm hearing from businesses everywhere in every sector about um, skills needs. And if you look long term, we've got massive workforce um, needs and challenges here. We did some research on aged care workforce. You know, if you fast forward to 2050, we've got a gap there of like 400,000 workers that we're going to need to, to provide the sort of care that we do. So this is going to have to factor in. In terms of do migrants and will migrants want to come back here, I think they will. Um, you know, obviously we've seen this dislocation, but let's face it, um, we can complain about a bunch of things. Australia is a great place to live. Um, it is, broadly speaking, notwithstanding comments yeah. about what's been happening recently, a safe and secure place. Um, we, we have a strong economy. Uh, I think they're going to be features that are really attractive to people. We've got a great education system. We've got leading universities. So, so I think they are going to want to come back. And the final thing I say, which is going to define our economic opportunities but also make it interesting for migrants, is whether we've got really interesting jobs. Mm. 
because in a world that's where people are competing for skills, good jobs, good pay and interesting work is what's going to bring people here. Andrew, how have you experienced this um, in the ACT? I, I know, you know, anecdotally in Sydney, you walk around and you see, you know, um, signs up in shops saying work wanted, work is wanted, and um, there's a real shortage of people. Are you experiencing that as well? Yeah, we've, we've had very low unemployment up until uh, a brief period during uh, two months of lockdown when uh, the unemployment rate rose. But yes, we're, we're very keen for, for more people in our city, more skilled migrants, more international students, and we are a refugee welcome zone and a welcoming city. Mm. And we have an amazingly diverse community, wonderful, uh, I think, economic future uh, in Canberra. And so we'll, we'll be striving for, uh, uh, to attract migrants uh, to our city. And we'll, we'll continue the, I guess, the focus uh, on you know, leadership in, in mm. areas that, that matter in this nation. And I think through, through the national capital, Australians you know, should be very proud of the, the country that we are and the welcoming country that we are. So I would argue for an increased migration program with an increase uh, in skilled migration and an increase in refugee and humanitarian intake uh, over the, the coming years. And I think we can do that and we can have an unemployment rate nationally you know, below 4%. We have the economic conditions and opportunity to achieve that now, and that's what we should mm. be striving for, together with tr uh, a really big investment in skills and training. And then we'll have the skilled workforce, and it's sort of over in large part to the private sector to create those really good jobs that will attract people here. Yeah, whether we get prices down from a million dollars. Just really quickly, Carla, you want to say something? On that point, exactly, is um, I was talking to a colleague who's in the top 5% of earners in Australia in that category, he can't afford to buy a house in Sydney. Yeah. So how I, I embrace everything you're saying and 100% agree with it. How do we then give those people the opportunity to afford a home? House price is a whole other program, Carla. We're going to have to take that one on notice, mate. I'll so, come back. Thank you. Come back. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> I might have saved you, Jason, but <laughs> there's, a, oh, no, no, there's no, a question. Jason's there's report. a question. No, no. There's a, question. There's, there's a simple answer, and and it, uh, number one, it's very it, it's multifaceted, but the answer ultimately is supply. You have to create more houses or dwellings. And, to... and tax reform, Jason. Yeah, well, well oh, and, uh, we, we did see... <laughs> you're right, you're and right. I'll come back we next did, week. And we social did, infrastructure. We could have a whole conversation <laughs> about negative gearing and what the impact on the last election as well, but we'll save for another day. Um, our next question comes from Sarah Baker, who we should point out is an independent candidate in the upcoming local Northern Beaches election. Thank you, Stan, and oh, good evening, panellists. Uh, so my question is uh, for Jason Felinski. When five coalition MPs crossed the floor to support Pauline Hanson's vaccine discrimination bill, Scott Morrison said, and I quote, the coalition isn't run like an autocracy and members are free to express different views. And yet when it came to supporting action on climate change, and you had the green light to cross the floor and represent your electorate's wishes on this critical issue, Absolutely. you decided not to. Mm -hmm. My question is, given you've been calling for more action on climate change, why do you lack the courage to cross the floor and represent your electorate? We're in question time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so, uh, away from you. <laughs> I assume Melinda wants to answer that question. Um, Sarah, thank you very much for that question. Um, look, uh, in, in answer to your question, it's quite simple. Uh, one person cannot change the world. Um, these things... So the, you can the, you can change a vote on the on the floor. Oh, you perhaps. absolutely can do that. You can absolutely do that. But what I would rather do is get the Australian government to commit to net zero by 2050. What I would rather do is get an updated projection to 2030. What I would rather do is see our emissions fall by 20% from 2005 levels. What I would rather do is if I go alone, I might go fast, but if I go together, I will go far. And my ambition for this country is to go a long way, not a short way quickly. J Jason, you've outlined your climate credentials. You've also been someone pushing for uh, a tougher, a better target, a tougher target for 2030. Yep. But you voted against protection of the Great Barrier Reef. When? Well, that, that's, that's on the record, isn't it? No, I mean, it's yes, not. Yes, it is. Oh, are you you're talking about this yes. fake, oh, this yeah. fake <laughs> left-wing front group um, <laughs> website? 
that, that has uh, misrepresented well, this. This is the sort of thing Sarah's going to. This is important. No, no, this is important. This is the sort of thing Sarah's going to. This is important. The difference between what you say No, no, and how no, no, this vote. is important. So there is a website out there. So what the Labor Party does is we will have a motion that increases funding on aged care funding. So the Labor Party will get to the second reading um, speech and they'll move an amendment. And I'll have things in, like, in there like, we want to increase it by 30% more, but um, Stan Grant is a bad person. And I could never vote for that, Stan. So thank I you. vote... Thank you. So I vote... <laughs> so I vote against that amendment. So this fake website... This fake website puts up a vote that says that I voted against increasing aged care funding. It's untrue. Mm. You know, you've got people like it, Andrew it, Bragg... It gives, it gives indicative votes. That's no, it, it does not yes. give that, indicative that, that, votes. If you says. want to see votes, if you want to see how your Member of Parliament is voting, there is one absolute record that is verified, mm. and that is Hansard. It's online. You can go and have a look at it. You can see how everyone voted. All the, there, there is a, a, a fake website that is funded by... It is a left-wing front group. It is funded okay. by people who only who are running campaigns against the Liberal okay. Party. Well, 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 we'll take a look at that and we'll say that... Patrick, well, thank the next you. Time thank you. Um, our final question comes from Rebecca Clark. Is the government acting in self-interest or the national interest when it spends the last two sitting weeks of the year and possibly of this term of government trying to rush through legislation to introduce voter ID and religious freedom? When many people say both of these bills are unnecessary and discriminatory, rather than legislation for a National Integrity Commission, which was promised by the PM over three years ago, and many Australians, or the majority of Australians, want. I might just go to you, Andrew, on this question of, of voter ID. I know you're not in the, the Federal Parliament, but one of the concerns here is that it leads to a, a voter suppression. Um, Indigenous people, for instance, may not have accessible um, ID um, that, they can, that they can show. Is that a concern? Yes, it is. Mm. This, is this is another solution looking for a problem. Uh, it's just it's so clear exactly what they're trying to do here. And it's the sort of tactics that are used in the United States by Conservative parties to suppress the vote. That's what it's all about. It's very, very clear. Oh, of course it is, Jason. No, it's not. You it. know it. We okay. all know I'll give, it. No, I'll, give, I'll give Jason a chance to quickly oh, thank respond. You. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Jason. <laughs> oh, sorry, Andrew's first. Oh, that was good. Um, well, firstly, can I address um, your question directly? Um, like, it's a nice slogan to say, why are we dealing with racial... Di uh, sorry, religious discrimination and voter ID laws before ICAC? Well, the, the truth is, voter ID laws have been proposed since the early 1990s. So if we want to play the game of what's been around longest, well, that's been around a lot longer than an independent commission against corruption. When you was want to Nick talk Bryan about sacked by when, I, by when I, you I, want to talk when you want to talk about when you want to talk 80s, about wasn't it? when you want to talk about um, when you want to talk about uh, uh, religious discrimination that was that has that promise has been outstanding for more than four years. We will do um, an integrity commission, an independent commission against corruption. It is there to be done. Um, when it comes to voter ID laws, what Andrew is saying is absolutely wrong and he is dividing the nation unnecessarily. Oh. Communities, <laughs> communities such as Indigenous communities, Stan, that you mm. looked at, you, if you turn up with someone who knows you, who can identify themselves, all they have to say is, I know that that's Jason and I can vote. If I have no form of ID because I've been at the beach... All I have to do is sign a declaration form which takes literally 30 seconds to do. The, if, if this is about voter suppression, then what Andrew Barr is saying and what the Labor Party is saying is Canada suppresses votes. The United Kingdom okay. suppresses votes. Can I, the French, the Italians, let's, let's the just, Spanish, let's just get a the quick, Greeks. Let's get a quick comment Finnish. from Melinda. Actually, actually just different. want a, qu a question. I mean, this is an issue that has been raised by Indigenous communities as being a, a real concern to them yep. around the impact that it will have on people. Yep. Um, and the miscommunication of it. And let's remember that there are communities where people don't speak English as a first mm. language Absolutely. in Australia, right? So my question is, to what extent have you had um, serious consultation with Indigenous communities about this? So we have a $10.6 million program in place to engage Indigenous communities, mostly in remote no, no, areas. No, but but, but uh, as you've thought about doing this, and given the fact that there doesn't seem to be we'll, a we'll huge to problem... Quick, we're almost out of time, but we'll have to, if you can just so, quickly so respond. To Melinda's question... This proposal has been consulted for literally over the last 20 years. This is something that goes back nearly seven years actively. JSCOM, which is the Joint Committee on, you know, Election Matters, 
proposed this almost two years ago. Okay. I might get a final comment from you, Michael, just to the overall question here about priority. And priority. Well, I think the religious discrimination law has been uh, on the table for a long time. It's actually more needed than people people imagine. As I say, we need to bring the states uh, together um, and, and some have some cohesion. It's also not as dramatic as everyone thinks. That is, it is it is simply uh, making national what is true in most states and not in some others. So I think a lot of the alarmist rhetoric about it is is uh, is, is not tr not correct at all. Uh, it goes to belief. Uh, there's ne need for more work on uh, other discrimination legislation, I think, but, um, but this is undramatic legislation that tight, it tightens and tidies up and makes a statement about uh, the affirmation of religious communities in Australia. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, and that's all we have time for. Thanks again for all of your questions. And our panel, Yara Boo Mellon, Michael Jensen, Melinda Salento, Jason Falinski and Andrew Barr. And our fantastic studio audience. Give yourselves a clap as well. my last Q&A for 2021. Um, I look forward to being back with you again next year, along with Virginia Trioli and David Spears. And next week, Virginia brings you our season finale. What a lineup! Singer Missy Higgins, comedian Arj Barker, broadcaster Narelda Jacobs, IPA's John Roskin and Hugh Van Kylenberg from the Resistance Project. Something for everyone. <laughs> Missy Absolutely. will be performing live for you as well. It'll take a lot to beat our panel tonight, that <laughs> thing. It would take a lot. Until then, take care. Have a good night. <laughs>